Measuring distances here on Earth is relatively easy. We can get out a measuring tape, or if we really want to get fancy, we can get one of those laser measuring things. But how do we measure distances in space? I mean, sure, we can, like, bounce lasers off the moon thanks to the, uh, the Apollo astronauts that left a corner reflector up there. But what about other stars and galaxies? I mean, first of all, it would take forever to get any kind of signal out there and back, and we don't have time to wait for that. And I don't think they will even bounce a signal to start with, even if we tried. Detecting the distance to objects within our own solar system is relatively straightforward. For larger objects like planets, we can bounce a signal off them. Um, often people will use like a, a, a radio signal, they'll send it up, they'll bounce it off the planet, they'll wait for it to come back, and then we can see how long it takes. And then because, well, the signal is limited by the speed of light, we can then calculate how far away the object is. When we begin to talk about objects close to us in the Milky Way, but still not too far away, we can use a simple parallax method. What we can do is we can, we can look at a star and we can then look how it is according to some background stars. Then we wait exactly half a year for the Earth to move around to the other side of the Sun and then we take a picture again and then we will see that star has moved compared to the background stars. And based on how much the star has moved, we can then uh, calculate exactly how far away it is. This will work great out to around 16,000 light years, something like that. Remember, the, our galaxy is like 100,000 light years-ish across. It's like our little corner of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the galaxy where we can use this method. If we want to go further out than that, we need candles. Not these type of candles, but something called standard candles. In astronomy, we have a certain type, a certain group of objects where we know exactly how much light they emit. And if we know exactly how much light they emit and we can see how much light reaches us, then with the inverse square law, we can then determine how far away it is. So if we have such an object, we can use this formula here to determine the distance to that object, where d here is the distance, lowercase m is the apparent magnitude, and uppercase m is the absolute magnitude. What's the difference? Apparent magnitude is how bright the star is as we see it. So when we look up in the night sky, how much light do we receive from that star? Apparent or absolute magnitude, sorry, that would be how much light we would receive from that star if it was exactly 10 parsec away, about 33 light years away from us. So we basically take the star, we move it in 10 parsec away, how much light would we receive? In order for us to calculate the absolute magnitude, of course, we would need to know how much light it actually emits, and this is where we need those standard candles. One of these types of objects is what's called Cephids. These are variable star that has moved away from their main branch and out to their giant branch. When they were in their main phase, they were in this perfect balance where they were balancing the gravity, the internal pressure of the star, and the radiation pressure to keep the star stable. But as it's moving out through this, uh, this giant branch, it can get into some unstable oscillations where the star begins to first grow bigger, then it becomes cooler and the density becomes lower and that makes it means it becomes brighter. And then it contracts again and as it contracts, it heats up again, density increases and, and light emission goes down as it gets smaller. The period of these oscillations where the star grows and shrinks is closely tied to the peak luminosity. And that means if we can measure the distance, or the, the distance, the period, how often it, how long it is between it's at its maximum peak and it's back to the maximum peak after going through a full period, then we can calculate exactly how much light that star emits, and thereby we can calculate its absolute magnitude. Now, there's of course a limit to how far we can go with this method, as while this would work great for detecting stars inside our own Milky Way, we need to be able to detect the individual stars before we can use this method and we can measure that period of the star. So obviously we can't just go to the deepest edges of the universe because we're not gonna be able to resolve individual stars out there. So if we want to move even further away, we need other standard candles. And that could, for instance, be a type 1a supernova. These supernova happens when you have a white dwarf with the remnants of a, um, of a dead star, so it's a non-fusioning star core. And a, another star next to it, it moves mass over to the white dwarfs and so it reaches some critical mass, and then the whole thing goes nova. Because this explosion, supernova always happens at the same mass, they are also very, very similar in their light output. 
and in fact, while they do vary slightly based on the metallicity of the star and stuff like that, um, while it do vary, we can, based on the light curve, how, how quickly it tapers off after the explosion, we can use that to determine what the peak luminosity of the star was, so getting the, the absolute magnitude of, uh, of the star. The good thing about these types of standard candles, they are so bright <laughs> that we can see them anywhere in the universe. If such an explosion happens, we'll be able to see it. They are very, very bright. Problem is, of course, they are rare. I mean, they don't just happen every day, and if we want to measure distance to, like, that galaxy, we kind of get a problem because then we need to wait for, for a specific a Type 1a supernova to happen in that galaxy which may not be in our lifetime. We can't just order these off Amazon. I do have an upcoming video where I will go into a lot more details about supernovas and the different types of supernova and how they happen. So get subscribed for that as well. So if you really want to go into deep, deep space and measure distances to truly deep sky objects, then we need to look at redshift. That is the final step in the cosmic distance ladder. If we have a galaxy far, far away, you will know the universe expands, and as it expands, the light from that star gets stretched out and redshifted. And the further the star is away, the more it gets redshifted. So if we can measure the, the, how much redshifting the light has, has gone through as it uh, came towards us, then we, can, um, then we can determine how far away it is. So we know that specific materials emit specific spectrums of light, and if we can see that spectrum just shifted, then we know, ah, but if we shift, how much do we need to shift that back in order to have the original? And then we kind of make the assumption that, that, that the physics is the same in that galaxy as it is in ours, and that light emits the same um, wavelengths depending on the materials in that galaxy as they do here, um, which I think is a fair assumption. But well, that's the final step. That is how we measure distances to the deepest, deepest corners of our universe. So it ejected this blob of plasma, and that plasma blob happened to be ejected in the rough direction of Earth. So essentially, they were just sorting the stars based on their hydrogen content. An interesting thing about the Bulma series is 